Here we are live from El Paso, Texas. It is Extra Rounds. I'm TJ DeSantis along with Brandon McCaffrey. And, uh, of course, Vanessa Demopoulos is here. And we're recapping UFC 280. We saw a new champion crowned uh, over in Abu Dhabi. Hey, everybody. It is Extra Rounds. Like I said, on scene here in El Paso, Texas, we just wrapped up Medusa, female-only jiu-jitsu, uh, about an hour, hour and a half ago. And, of course, we've got uh, EBI 20 tomorrow on UFC Fight Pass. But we got to... Get our thoughts in and share them on UFC 280. Guys, a new champion is crowned atop the lightweight division. And uh, it's almost like a, a return to the throne for Khabib Nurmagomedov, who, you know, obviously is the, the main trainer of uh, Islam Makashev, who, who got the win tonight. Your thoughts, BMAC, uh, kick us off on, on Makashev, who, you know, he seems to be someone that could, you know, sort of reign over this division in similar to the fashion as, as Khabib did. Yeah, not just this division, but I think he might have his eyes set on Volkanovski. They brought Volkanovski in the ring to talk to him, and they both seem key. I mean, that's as good as signing on the dotted line right there. They bring him into the ring to talk to Volkanovski. Volkanovski, you know, he's highly touted. A lot of people feel like he's the best pound-for-pound -pound player in the world. And so Islam's looking to step up there and take that crown I just mean, for himself. Uh, Vanessa, your thoughts on the way that Mikashev won today because it, we all know his grappling is great and we also know that you know Charles Oliveira is a, a phenomenal submission player as well but it was the power on the feet that you know floored Oliveira and then it was a submission that ultimately got it done for Mikashev. Yeah I thought that it was wild actually almost a little bit premature that he even had the title contention shot um, especially when there were other people that were really looking forward to stepping in there and then for him to be as dominant as he was with the wrestling with the grappling uh, prior to that match I was saying that if uh, it did go to the ground that we were going to see some really expert level jiu-jitsu from Oliveira which we know him to have um, we saw him get hurt in that fight which he gets hurt every single fight right. so I wasn't expecting the the dominance that the new champion had brought forth but I mean it was so amazing to watch him do that on such like home turf yeah you know when I look at the mission in the way that it was thrown in. It was, you know, moments after uh, Oliveira was dropped. Uh, I'm curious, PMAC, when you look at how Mikashev got the win, did it have a lot to do with the way that he dropped him, or was it just that submission was so tight that Oliveira was, was forced to tap? Because it seemed like he was still hurt and rattled. I mean, definitely it played a factor, for sure. I I'm reminded of BJ Penn versus Matt Hughes, when BJ cracks Matt with that hard strike and then immediately falls into the ground, and you know, might have been that strike that really led to the choke. And you see that a lot, you know. It's a complete game. So, obviously, the strike had a big factor in it. But, man, that just death squeeze that Islam has. By the time he got over, I mean, he had it locked up and he was putting the sub on. And by the time he slid off into the full pass and out into the side control position, it was a wrap. And, dude. You saw Oliveira. He couldn't tap enough. He's like, pull him off of me. Get him out of here. He's killing me. Yeah, what does it say for Mikashev moving forward? Because, you know, Vanessa, you said it, like, relatively unproven when it looked, you know, look at other uh, title contenders and challengers at 155. But Mikashev got his opportunity, made the most of it, and now they're already talking about a, a super fight with the 145-pound champion. Yeah, and I think it's like, it, it's almost a slap in the face to Benil, who's been sitting on the sideline <sighs> for how long now, waiting and waiting and knocking on the door and continuing to prove himself. He proved himself tonight that he was worthy. And I truly thought that that fight was a about to be a contender fight. You know, right. I felt like you had two fights laying there on the line for contender of the two champion fights that were happening. And then they bring in Volkanovski. So it's almost like, and I mean, hats off to Volkanovski, who's now potentially going to be a double champion, which is something that he was calling out for prior to this fight occurring. Right. He was willing to fight either champion. But I mean, Benil is just not, he's been knocking on this door and he couldn't knock any louder. Yeah, when I, I think about uh, Benil Dariush and, and what he's done, like all, all the guy does is win, you know. All he, he does, does is win. All he does is win, and <laughs> he was the the underdog, like a sizable underdog. Yeah, to Gamron. To, to Gamron, and you know the fact that he got his hand raised, it's almost an afterthought now oh. after the Volkanovski, um, you know, brought, uh, br like stare down. And, and DC even said, and you, I think, said the same exact thing, BMAC. It's almost like signing on the dotted line. It's like making that the next fight, like. Is that the next fight, Brandon? Like, it has to be now. You know, I think you guys make a great point, though. I mean, the man hasn't even defended his lightweight. Or it hasn't right. even defended his title no, yet. No. And now we're trying to trot him out to become the two-division champion. Right. You know, a lot of people don't believe you even are the champion until you defend the belt. So, you know, we probably – we're probably going to see that Volkanovski match. 
But I don't know if we're going to see it next. I think, I mean, Darius, you've got to start paying him a little bit of respect, you know. But he doesn't, he do, he doesn't go up there and he doesn't call the name that he wants. Right. And that's, listen, whether you like it or whether you don't, that's part of the game in the UFC. That's part of the game in prize fighting. We're yeah. fighting for prizes, not just titles. You know, I, I think there's this old idea, which it's true. The UFC wants athletes that don't necessarily always pick and choose their, their next opponent. But sure. there's also nothing wrong about calling your shot and asking for it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, sure, you want to be a, a company person. I mean, Vanessa, you fight for the UFC. You're obviously, <laughs> you know, under contract with them. But if you have an opponent that you want to fight, I don't think there's anything wrong with making it known who that is. Talk your shit. Talk your shit. You know, Benil needs to get out there and he needs to kind of be a little bit more. And he's so vocal, but he's so humble. Right. He's like, he's like, hey, listen, I'm letting you guys know, but also. Yeah. Like, also, I'm just going to, you know, he's quiet about it. And they're just going to let him be where he's at for that. Um, but who knows? Who knows what the UFC is truly thinking? But Volkanovsky is as loud as they come right now, and he is freaking on fire. So from a business standpoint, I mean, it's the right move to make. Let's talk real quick about uh, DuBronx. Charles Oliveira obviously comes up uh, short tonight. This is a, a, a you know, it wasn't even defending his title, technically. It was a vacant title after what happened in Arizona and the, and the scale and the Man, condition there. that was there. so weird to see it, to be honest with you. I just kept looking at that number one next to his name instead of the C. And right. I was like, why is that there? He walked out wearing yellow shorts. And I was like, why is he not wearing champ shorts? And right. I just kept forgetting yeah. the fact that he had missed weight and they stripped him of the title. Yep. But I think goodness all week long they kept showing him with a title belt. But man, I was so confused. Right. Like, yeah. All night. Now, looking at what he's gone through throughout his career, this is a guy that's moved up and down between weight classes. He, he's been in the UFC, and I think I mean there was a point in time where not that he was an afterthought by any means, but no one really foresaw the championship rise that he obviously had. But now he needs to sort of go through another renaissance. B Mac, mm -hmm. do you think that? He's got what it takes to go out there and, and try to rise to another title fight? Or is this sort of the beginning of the, the end for Charles Oliveira as an elite contender? Oh, no, I don't think it's anywhere close to the end of his career. And I think he showed flashes tonight that he could do good things, you know. Like he could still get in there and fight with Islam. It's just Islam got the better of him tonight. I don't think that he was expecting Islam to be as sharp and as accurate as he was on the feet. And I think when Oliveira goes back into camp, that he's going to have, you know, he, he had a lot of confidence. Right. He had a lot of confidence. He came out and basically pulled guard to open the fight. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you don't do that unless you feel like this is going to go your way. The part where it fell apart for him was getting his head stuck over against the cage. Right. That was some, that was some difficult to work on your guard when your head stuck against the cage. And the part where it really fell apart. He didn't expect Islam to come out and be as crisp and as sharp and as accurate as he was on the feet. And I think that threw Charles for a loop. And, you know, when he ain't that right hand, yeah. doing for something else. Yeah. Uh, I think Paul Felder said it on the broadcast that uh, if he was the matchmaker, he might match up uh, Oliveira with uh, Dariush. I, I mean, if, if Benil's not going to fight for a title next, I mean, is that the move, Vanessa? Oh, man. You know what? Yes. Number one, yes, that's the move. But also, number two, if I'm Benil, I got to open up my mouth and I have to start calling for that title contention. Yeah. And we watched Carla Sparza do it against Rose Namajunas, yeah. where she said, you know what? I am in line for this belt. I want this belt. I refuse to take any other fight aside from this belt. And you kind of, like, she kind of put the UFC in a position where it was like, even Rose Namajunas was like, yeah, Carla's the next fight. You know, so, like, they, they, it made sense to make that fight happen, even though Carla was, like, she was just very stubborn. And I feel like Benil needs to take that approach, you know, because Carla has the same approach as well. Like, she's not somebody who's consistently calling people out. She's not very loud about the way that she goes about her right. demeanor. But, man, she was very consistent and persistent about she wanted to be the champion in the same way that Benil is. So, if I'm Benil, I'm going to win on the sidelines. But, hey. Like, that's not, you know, like, well, I don't know what you should do. <laughs> you, you have to craft your own story in this sport. Yes, yes. That's exactly what you're saying with Darius. You have to craft your own story. And Charles has already started crafting his own story. When he was speaking to DC after the fine, he's like, look, you know that I belong in here. Yes. You know, you know what needs to happen next. I need to get another re And to be fair, we almost always see a rematch after a champion goes down. He almost always gets the next look at it. And that's the thing I think we need to highlight again. Like, yes, he wasn't the champion tonight uh, defending, but 
for all intents and purposes, he never lost his status in my he mind. Was the best he was the He was the champion. Right. Yeah. yeah he, he was, was the champion. champion. Everybody recognized him as the champion. If the people recognize you as the champion, you're the champion. Now look, by the rules of the game, he's not the champion. Right. Sure. I get it. Sure. I get it. He 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 dropped but that one. Perception is reality. The people believed he was the champion. People don't believe he's the champion anymore. We got a new, we got a new king right there. We do have a new king in the division. Yep. and that is Islam. Yep. We'll see what happens next. Uh, Volkanovski, Darius. I'm not going to be mad at either of those fights. I think they would both be phenomenal to watch. But uh, in my heart of hearts, I believe that the world <laughs> should be a meritocracy as much as possible. And I don't think anybody's earned it more than Benil Darius in a lot of ways. I think Oliveira's earned it. I think the next fight should be Oliveira. All right. Like the more, I, the more we sit and talk about it, the more I just believe that. Oliveira has earned his – he's earned a chance to keep himself in the title mix. I don't hate you that know, either. If he comes back in there, doesn't go his way again, listen, back in line, back of the line. But yeah, right now – Yeah, I will now, tell you, I don't think that Oliveira will ever be back of the line considering his whole journey – even getting to become the champion initially, having to go through the losing of weight, having to kind of keep his composure throughout all of that, still continuing to win that fight, being the people's champion, even though he wasn't the current champion. I mean, that man has earned every right to his legacy, and I don't think he's ever going to be pushed all the way back. You know, he's always going to be right there, and he should be. That's where he belongs. I he's so earned too. that. Let's talk about the uh, co-main event. Another title was on the line as we saw Aljamain Sterling in his second title defense against TJ Dillashaw. Uh, the Funkmaster reigned supreme. And I, I kind of feel bad for Aljamain Sterling when you look at what he's gone through mm. throughout his career. I mean, he captured the, the, title, the only man to ever capture an undisputed crown in the UFC via disqualification. He came back, had a very close fight, but, you know, defeated Peter Yan. And tonight he gets the win over TJ Dillashaw, who was game but was obviously hurt. I mean, he was he was... Uh, you know, complaining to the officials, not complaining, but notifying the uh, officials that, hey, if my shoulder pops out in the middle of the uh, fight, don't stop the fight. It's an ongoing injury that I've dealt with uh, throughout training camp. And, you know, sure enough, the first takedown from uh, Aljamain Sterling popped it out. And uh, ultimately, it was the end of uh, TJ Dillashaw's night um, after he just couldn't compete. And, and it hindered him. You know, I, w I was amazed that he was able to get back to the round after or the stool after that first round. Like, I mean, all I mean, props to, to yeah. TJ Dillashaw. But, uh, you know, going back to what I was saying about Aljamain Sterling, like, people are going to talk about how this wasn't a, a legitimate It feels win. like it's got an asterisk a little and bit. And it shouldn't. I it agree shouldn't. with you. I mean, it wasn't his fault that TJ Dillashaw, you know, decided to go through his training camp, battle through an injury, and ultimately still go in and fight, you know? But Being in shape to fight, and, and I don't mean just your conditioning. I mean, your body has to be in shape to fight. And TJ's... That's part of the game, man. That's really the the way the game is played. Everybody goes through struggles during training camp, and they're bringing something into the fight. In this case, it happened to be a shoulder that keeps falling halfway off your body. Right, yeah. You know, and... Say it louder for the people in the back. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but it's just... It's it's such a bummer for Aljamain. Right. Because, like you said, man, he keeps doing the work that he needs to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And something keeps happening that makes people want to put an asterisk beside right. it. But Aljamain hasn't earned those asterisks. No, not those at all. Those are not his asterisks. They go by the fights. Right, yeah. In history, they should go by the fights. But they shouldn't go beside Aljamain. And that's the thing, too. And Vanessa, you said, you know, you know, talk your shit. Yeah. Aljamain Sterling has done just that. He's doing yes. great. And a lot of people don't like him for it. But I think that he is really good at sort of occupying the space that he does Occupy, and while there may or may not be an asterisk next to this win, it was still rep impressive nonetheless, and he's the undisputed champ for a reason. Oh, it was absolutely impressive, and I mean, hats off to Aljo. He, like, he is such an amazing champion. He's very charismatic. You know, he's out there. He's doing all the things that are necessary that you would wish for a champion to do on top of being as dominant as he is. I mean, the people that he's beaten along the way, even to get to the – fact that he even fought Peter Yan in the first place to then get kneed in the face. You know, unfortunately, he had to sit out even longer than he was anticipating to heal from that injury. And then he comes back and wins in dominant fashion, you know, taking back control and showing that, like, he truly is the champion. And now against TJ Dillashaw, like, I don't care if TJ did already have a reoccurring injury. The fact is, just like BMAC said, you chose to fight. So the fact that you went out there, your shoulder happened to pop out a socket, not because you threw a 
punch, but because you got taken down. Mm -hmm. There was an offensive position by Aljamain Sterling that caused TJ's shoulder to pop out of socket. So Aljamain did that shit which was just like a submission. Yeah. And it was a beautiful freaking thing for him to do. And hats off to TJ for continuing to fight through that injury, you know, and to even be able to tell the refs in the back, like, please don't stop this fight, bro. Like, I am here. I want to fight. This is a championship. I want to win. Let me go through this. And that's okay. Cool. But don't talk about it on the mic afterwards as if it's a giant excuse as to why mm. you lost. Yeah. That's I, just a cop-out. And it makes Aljo look really bad as a champion. And it's terrible because he did not earn that, like you guys said. Right. I mean, there were, there were two things going through my mind when Dillashaw got on the mic in the post-fight interview and apologizes. One, you know, I, I kind of felt, again, for, for, for Sterling, because I think it undermines his performance to a certain extent. But the other thing that I thought, too, was I understand why TJ did it. You know, you know granted, it was his own doing, but he was out for two years, you know, due to a uh, USADA violation. And then he gets this opportunity. And if he has to go through so shoulder surgery, who knows if it's there on the other side of, of recovery? You don't know. This is a, a, a sport of opportunity. you got to take the, the opportunities when they come. But he did apologize to the division. Was it bad of Dil Dillashaw, you think, Vanessa, to you know, take this fight when he clearly knew it was likely he was going to be uh, underperforming to his best abilities because of the injury? Not bad. Terrible. It takes about, what, six weeks to heal from an injury like that? Who knows? Every injury is different surgeries are all different but he said that he's known about this injury for such a long amount of time I think he said april april he heard it in april i heard so april yeah he that's what april. i heard april that is so much time it's october you definitely could have legitimately had surgery healed from surgery and continued to do your fight camp up until this point or maybe like, they moved the fight to december it's not like this card was a weak card that needed a co-main event title fight to bill it i don't know yeah i mean i i just i just do not agree with um the way that he handled it, and that's okay, because had you won, would you have, you know, kind of leaned on that as well? Like, who knows? Well, who knows? E even if he won, he was going to have to have surgery anyway, probably, likely. I mean, if this is a reoccurring issue where it's popped out 20 times in training camp, like, something needs to be done. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so, not just rest, so. Congratulations to Aljamain Sterling for now uh, being the undisputed champion a second time around. Yeah, 100%. And I, I loved Aljo's uh, post-fight uh, comments as well. Like, he's he's a guy, like, I mean, he was calling Cheeto Vera Dorito Man or something, <laughs> you know, like, he, he just says everything he needs to say, and, and, you know, I like that. He might rub people the wrong way, but he's a character, you know, and, yes. and that's one thing you need to do as an athlete is make people care about who you are and, and why you're fighting, and, you know, for better or worse, I think Aljamain Sterling uh, makes people care. Um, let's talk about uh, the fight sh uh, between the Sugar Show, Sean O'Malley, and um, Peter Yan, it was uh, a fight that a lot of people were sort of confused upon on why it was made when you have a guy who's not in the top ten taking on the number one contender in, in, in Peter Yan. But uh, Sean O'Malley was able to make the most of his opportunity today uh, in Abu Dhabi. He gets the win. And, you know, look at the highlights. Like, th this guy's been in the UFC for like four or five years. You know, this is not long ago. Snoop Dogg was freaking out on the contender <laughs> series. And now he's potentially maybe one fight away from a title fight. I got to go down the, the, the panel here. Your guys' thoughts on the decision. It was split. Uh, two judges for, for O'Malley, one judge for Peter Yan. BMAC, you have the honors. How'd you score it? I scored it for O'Malley. Okay. I scored it for O'Malley. I think it really came down to the first round. All right. You know, I think that that one could have gone either way, and I think when you go back and poll anybody, they're going to go, well, I had it for Yan because I had him in round one. Right. Two was clearly Yan. I felt just based on the damage that was delivered that three was clearly Sean's round. And number one, I gave to O'Malley as well. All right, so we got one of our three judges here for Sean O'Malley, Vanessa Demopoulos. I, um, I actually thought Peter Yan won the fight. Okay. And it, it wasn't so decisive that, like, when they called Sean's name, I was like, no way, man. It's not I was like, okay. All right, I see how the judges could see that. But I thought that uh, Peter Yan had – I thought the first round was very close. Right. It really could have gone either way, to be honest. And um, the second round, oh, my gosh, dude. Like, the, the Sugar Sean came out and then pop, pop, and then hurt, hurt Peter Yan. And then Peter Yan came back and was like, pop, pop. And it was all within the first minute of the right. second round. Yeah. And I was just losing my mind over here, like, watching that fight. And I feel like Peter Yan, like – 
um, Sugar Sean kept going for different types of takedowns and stuff. And then yep. Peter Yan would reverse them. And then Sugar Sean's on the bottom, and he's trying to pull jujitsu stuff. And I'm like, oh my god, Peter Yan is so much stronger than you because like he's smaller, he's more condensed, you know. And I know that um, they had Tenkinio in their corner of Sugar Sean, but I'm like, man, like I, I see who throwing up these arm bars, these triangle attempts. But Peter Yan, he understands this stuff, you know. Like he's been doing this for a while. He's not brand new to this game, and he's so much stronger than you. Right. And I don't feel like um, I feel like Sugar Sean should have gotten up in a lot of different opportunities. So I felt like Peter Yan had better cage control overall. I felt like he had better um, control time uh, where Sugar Sean was on the bottom, even throwing up submissions. And conceding bottom position. And conceding. Sean was conceding the bottom position Correct. a lot of those times. And I felt like the striking was close enough that overall I thought Peter Yan had won the fight, but I wasn't surprised when they gave it to Sugar Sean. So we're split here on extra rounds, which is true to life. There Sorry. you go, Chad. Well, how did you score well, it? So I want to take the cop <laughs> out here. Uh, no, how did you score it? <laughs> I think the winner of that fight was us. We won. Yes. Oh, we, did, we all won. We won. Everybody won. <laughs> we won. So truth is, I lean towards Peter Yon. I thought Yon won the fight when it comes down to the 10-point must system. I thought it was a very close first round, but, you know, I did score the about 29-28. Uh, for Peter Yan, but the bottom line is this: Sean O'Malley gets his hand raised, yes. and and did so in a fashion. While it might be contentious, you might not agree with it. Who's ever done anything like that to Peter Yan before? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Like oh my just, gosh, that was such an exciting fight. Like, I'm not a hundred percent sure that Sean O'Malley agrees with the decision. It was he kind of you know? cracked a wry smile. You know, yeah. it was it was one of those things where it was like I think he even said, "Well, let's just give the people what they want." You know, and that, yeah. that's that's a Sean O'Malley title fight. So I'm going to ask you, Brandon, um, if if I do a buy or sell with you, buy or sell, is Sean O'Malley ready for a title fight? Well, I mean, he just took out Peter Yan. Right. He's right. ready. Right. He's ready. Yeah. What I mean, if you needed some more evidence, what would you want to see? What else do you need to see from it? I mean, again, he controversially, even if it's that, controversially beat the number one contender. There's no one else that you could beat that would make it more solidifying that he is the number one contender. So, yeah. yeah, It's, it's true. I buy I buy it. I, he's ready for title fight. I'm buying it. I'm not just buying I'm buying a bunch of it. Okay, so I want really, a bunch. I'm like really whole, behind him, yeah. A wholesale. Yeah. I, it's, like he said, it's what the people want. Right. We're, again, man. This is prize fighting. It's true. This is prize fighting. And Sean O'Malley puts butts in seats, and he he sells pay-per-views. The people want to see Sean O'Malley. And if he beats the number one contender and he beats him, look, was it close? It was close. <laughs> but tomorrow when he wakes up, he's going to have a W beside his name in right. that score column. Right. And that's what really matters. The people want him, and now he's got a W against the number one contender. It's easy buy for me. So, Vanessa, does he get the next title fight? If we're agreeing that he you know, is ready for one, is it the next one? Because th there are guys out there like Cheeto Vera. Yeah, I mean, you know, when they even asked Al Jermaine today, uh, Sugar Sean wasn't on that list. He did have quite a few people that I agreed with him on, and I forget who they are right now, but I agreed with him on, especially Cheeto Vera. Uh, but, man, Sugar Sean, he, you just sold me on it, to be honest, because <laughs> I was like, man, I'd love to see him get at least one more fight of somebody in the top five prior to going for a title contention. But, damn, he proved it. Right. You know, Peter Yan is as amazing as they come. You know, somebody who's so well-versed in every area of MMA. And we just watched Sugar Sean put the W next to his own name against somebody like that. So I think that he could be – he's ready for it as well. You know, I feel like emotionally he's ready to step in there. But I think that Cheeto is definitely standing in line pr in front of him personally. I feel like I, there's I only one man. The line right there. Yeah, there's only one man who can come between. Sean O'Malley in the title fight, and it's Cheeto. And it's the one person who's actually beat Sean O'Malley. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> That's true. It's the that one guy. So maybe maybe the title shot is not what the people need. Maybe we really need to see Cheeto and Sean one more time just to, set, hey. just to settle it for sure and then send the winner on in. If that's the case, if that would be the fight that would happen, you need to have uh, a title fight for uh, Aljamain, one of the names that – was floating out there, and I don't know if it's going to happen. He'd have to come back out of retirement. Is Henry Cejudo? Mm. Are you guys into that? Yeah, I'm into that. I'm into it a lot. Yeah, I'm into that. Like I, for whatever reason, like I I'm, know, a, I'm personally at the gym with Henry Cejudo, of course. and I will tell you that he has been training. There you go. I believe that he is back in the USADA pool. 
All right. Oh. Some breaking news here, maybe. Yeah. No, I, I think that's public information. Okay. Yeah. Right. I All believe. Right. I, I don't know for sure, but I do believe that he is back in the USADA t- uh, testing pool. I do know for sure that he has been training daily. So. You see, I, I think, you know, that, that fight would be huge. You know, I know that people love or hate Henry Cejudo. I tend Most to. Most people hate him. I tend. <laughs> I, I think that I. I think he's, he's quite the heel. I think he's so cringe. I love it. You know what oh I mean? Oh my gosh! Like, like he, he's he's healed me into like wanting he to buy the Henry Cejudo he's shirt. He's my friend, but man, he's that's hard to. But, it's but, hard but, to but stand that's the thing. It's, it's such a gimmick, though. Like if you're, I feel like a smart pro wrestling fan when I you know hear Henry. You're Cejudo a talk. mark. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm a smart. <laughs> I'm a smart. I, I get the bit, so I can appreciate. Okay. It. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. I don't know. I'm not going to be mad. There's so many options here at 135, and uh, Cejudo would be good. Cheeto Vera would be good. But now I'm just thinking about Cheeto versus Sean O'Malley. And I if need Cejudo to, you know, comes off the bench, I absolutely think he deserves an immediate title shot whenever he decides to come back. Oh, absolutely. Whoever's sitting up there with the belt, Cejudo deserves a shot at him. Just He didn't, he didn't leave because he got right. ran out. He decided to walk away yeah. while he was the king. So, I think if he decides to come back, just same thing just happened to George. Not just, but it happened to George St. Pierre. Right. When he decided to walk back in, he didn't walk back in, even in the same division. No. He walked straight up to the title at 185. Yeah, and I mean, that's the thing, too. Henry Cejudo, some people that don't like Henry are probably saying, you can't compare Henry Cejudo to George St. Pierre. You absolutely can. You can. can. Absolutely can. can. I'm doing it right now. I mean, you absolutely (laughs) can. He's, He's one of the greatest of all time. So, um Last thing on this before we uh, get to a little bit of an EBI preview. Um, we mentioned three top names for Aljamain Sterling. And Cejudo, um, uh, Cheeto, Sean Cheeto O'Malley, thank Cheeto. you, Sean O'Malley. Uh, rank the, the best and worst matchups for Sterling. Who does he have the best chance against compared to the hardest fight against? Well, I think the hardest fight for anybody in that division behind Aljamain is Cheeto Vera. I think Cheeto's... I mean, Cheeto's a gangster dude. Yeah, he is. So when you get into a fight with Cheeto Vera, it doesn't matter what the score box says at the end. You feel like you lost. Something terrible <laughs> happened to you if you fought <laughs> Cheeto Vera that day. It's true. That's, amazing. that's a terrible day at the office, even if you got the dub. <laughs> you know. So I think that's the hardest fight that's out there. Is it the best matchup? I mean, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. I think? really like that a lot. I, I love what you just said. You know, and I mean, we're looking at Cheeto Vera, who is like a pronounced striker. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. He has excellent wrestling, takedown, and defense. I mean, he's a very well-rounded fighter in yeah. general. He's got some of the best cardio in the entire UFC, let alone in the division. I mean, Cheeto's pretty freaking awesome. You know what else that Cheeto's got in spades? He wants it. He does. Oh, yeah. He does. Yeah. He does. Man. Yeah, if desire is, is wants it. Yeah, skill, he's, get, he's got that in abundance because uh, – and just what a great story, you know, for, for him being from Ecuador and, you know, really waving that flag and, and representing that country in the UFC. Like, it's hard not to cheer for someone like Cheeto Bear. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, we'll see what happens. All right. Uh, I'm TJ DeSantis. He's Brandon McCatherine. She's Vanessa Demopoulos, little monster here in El Paso, Texas. We are getting ready for EBI, which uh, is tomorrow. We just got done with uh, Medusa. Um, let, let's recap Medusa a little bit because, I mean, I, I love uh, combat sports and I love Brazilian jiu-jitsu and combat jiu-jitsu. And Medusa is really carving out a nice spot for itself in the landscape uh, with, you know, being an all-women uh, promotion. Vanessa, you've uh, been in the commentary booth a couple times. You've been on the Medusa mat. Uh, what, what were your thoughts on the show tonight? The, uh, tonight was absolutely spectacular. You know, uh, I fought in Medusa 1 and Medusa 2 in the 115 bracket and then again in the bantamweight bracket at 135. And it's just really awesome to watch these females go out there, scrap it out. Uh, we had EBI-style tournament tonight as well as combat jiu-jitsu-style tournament tonight. So it's like you're watching these girls slap each other. You're watching smaller girls compete at the bantamweight. You're watching girls that probably should be bantamweight go down and lose weight to compete at flyweight because they felt like they had a better advantage of smacking girls. I mean, it was violent. It was awesome. People's noses were bloody. I think we saw some broken ligaments today. I mean, it couldn't have been more awesome and amazing <laughs> and exciting. You know I freaking love jiu-jitsu, man. I, mean, we, 
I, I can't speak for you guys because you obviously know a lot more about jujitsu than I do. But we saw a, a couple submissions I've never seen ever before. Like a I was confused like in what? that. Yeah, that walk us through that. We saw a, a, a what a Z lock. Z lock. Yeah, Claire North hit a Z lock in her opening match. It's a movement. Um, you know, it's it's not like a new move. But it's kind of new at the high level. Okay. You know, so it's something it was that. Good to me. <laughs> it's something that I learned from and Chris Herzog so. uh, back in the day. Chris Herzog's great 10th Planet Black Belt, Sambo guy out of Rochester, New York. He showed that to us back in the day. Don't use it all that much. But now you see Juni Ocasio, and he's just killing with it. We just saw it happen. Uh, I believe it was Pato that hit that at ADCC, hit that Z lock. With Junie in his corner, you know, and then we see Claire North. She goes, hey, I just learned that this week. Yeah, that's and, crazy, too, to learn something like that and then pull it off on a high level to, you know, advance through a tournament to win a belt. I mean, she ran out there and, and put the Z-lock down in her first match like that was exactly the plan. Yeah. So it was beautiful. She overhooks the leg, reaps, controls the second leg, and then presses and creates that Americana-style pressure across the hip. Sick move. Yeah, one thing, uh, my biggest takeaway from, from Medusa, and it was almost just sort of a, a side note in the grand scheme of things, because Angela Hill did not progress in the tournament, but when Eddie Bravo talked about introducing combat jiu-jitsu and, and putting on these shows, he said it was a gateway for young and up-and-coming mixed martial artists to, you know, dip their toe in the water before going full amateur or full pro, but it was also an opportunity for some MMA athletes who have been around for a long time to still compete and, uh, you know, mix things up on the BJJ mat while also utilizing strikes, and Angela Hill, who came into the Ultimate Fighter so many years ago as a Muay Thai-based uh, athlete, struggled in the UFC after the show, left, evolved, came back, and has done incredibly well. She's been a staple of that 115-pound division. Tonight, she didn't win here at Medusa, but I thought she was incredibly impressive. Yeah, I thought that we all won because of the fact that she was just out there in general and knowing her story and her, like, overcoming and becoming. I just love those types of stories. I really do. I feel like I have my own story like that. So every time I see someone, I got to cheer for them. Um, but it was awesome. She threw the first strike of the night tonight, and it was just amazing to be able to cheer for her. I mean, she really evolved in her jiu-jitsu. And that's the thing with combat jiu-jitsu it's still jiu-jitsu right you know it's not mma no so it's like you have people who do go out there and throw strikes and they end up um putting themselves into very compromising positions because you're going against somebody who might be very very high level in pure jiu-jitsu right where they see those opportunities and capitalize on them it's just freaking awesome i literally love cjj so much um, just for those reasons, like, and we got to see the difference tonight in EBI versus combat jiu-jitsu as they were both stacked on top of each other, you know, in the EBI rule sets, like you saw girls going to their back, they were going for leg attacks and all that, where I felt like in the combat jiu-jitsu, they were a little bit more hesitant to do so because you might get popped in the mouth. So Yeah, and we saw that in the final match as, where Nakia Jackson, man, she was looking so good and she Busted Bree's face up, Bree Stick, who went, her up. went ahead to win. But Nakaya got a little bit overzealous trying to move into a position. She got reversed. And, man, she probably had that match locked up until that point. Yeah. Like if she could have kept that position on top, I think she was headed towards a finish in regulation. But Bree digging down, showing what a champion is made of, persevering. And then, and then so much adversity that she had to overcome in the overtime as right, well yeah. against Nakaya. It was a crazy uh, overtime, and it was a uh, razor thin, man. Yeah, very good fight. Twenty seconds, I think, was the difference in ride time and fastest escape time. I'm spoiling it for you if you haven't seen it, but you should go check it out. Medusa available for you uh, on demand anytime at UFC Fight Pass. UFC Fight Pass is the destination tomorrow for EBI 20. The absolutes, a potential fifty thousand dollar prize is on the line. And uh, BMAC, for me, Eddie Bravo in in the the Eddie Bravo Invitational really changed the idea of submission grappling as a televised you know, product, something that people can sit back and, you know, watch. And, like, I mean, don't get me wrong. I feel like Brazilian jiu-jitsu and, and submission grappling is a niche of a niche. Combat sports as a whole are a niche. But this style of, of format with EBI and the, the television and the production, the pomp and circumstance, it feels like a fight card. It feels like a fight show. And they're going to be fighting tomorrow for potential $50,000. It's so exciting! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. She's terrifying. <laughs> you do this every week with her? Like, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I put you in the middle. Yeah, $50,000 is a lot of money for jujitsu. Right? Yeah. It was just 
it feels like just two, three years ago, the the big money tournaments were a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks in somebody's high school gym yeah. on the weekend, and now we're popping up at ADCC. We packed in fifteen thousand people into the Thomas and Max right. Center, dude, and now we're going EBI absolutes. We're bringing in all these ADCC medalists and like. Uh, Nikki Rod, two-time silver medalist, Badoni, he's coming straight off of a big-time gold medal performance at ADCC. Bame, he was at ADCC. I mean, we're just piling them in and giving away $50,000 to jujitsu. Yeah. We're just in a completely yeah. different spot in the world than we were oh, two, three years spot. ago. It's a beautiful spot. Right now is one of the best times to be an athlete, to be a jiu-jitsu athlete. I mean, if, if this is inspiring to you guys, go out there, find some mats, choke some people unconscious. It's a great feeling. And then you get paid to do it. What? Sorry. Sorry. My bad. Sorry. <laughs> she, she's excited. In case you, Let's you know, go. Um, this is crazy. Well, well you know, I think, I think, TJ, the reason that we've moved into a place where the athletes can make money now has a lot to do with the fact that the athletes are the kind of athletes that can make money now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just a bu- it's not a bunch of guys like me out there winning nagas and stuff. Like these are guys who've been training since they were kids. Like you think about Cade Rotolo, right. who's yes. one of our combat jiu-jitsu champions. Cade, he's been training since he was a baby. Yeah. He doesn't know anything except combat. He doesn't right. know anything except grappling. And so and then he runs out and wins ADCC with Four subs. He just had a big win over the Sambo world champion last night. So, you know, these guys, they're athletes from the jump now. They're not just picking up jujitsu right. as adults. So the athletes are getting paid because the athletes are prepared to be paid for yeah. the first time. They're the kind of athletes that deserve to be paid for the first time. I think that's one of the most beautiful parts about the sport right now. You know, like you're saying, but I mean, it's not just the Rotolo brothers who have been training since they were three years old. Like, even the athletes that have started a little bit later, they are treating this like a real actual that's what I'm saying. job. Yeah. And it's so beautiful that we all get to benefit as spectators. And then also the fact that they now get to kind of reap some of those rewards of putting all those sacrifices on the line day in, day out, every single training session, every single competition, every weekend that they miss to go out there to compete for maybe nothing, maybe potentially catch an injury. And now they get an opportunity like this at the EBI to get paid $50,000 in submitting every person along the way. And it would be, it would be wrong of me to not bring up how did the sport get to this point without mentioning Gordon Ryan? Right. It, who, would, who it would be a sin. He, I mean, he's won multiple EBIs, but he's won this absolute division as well. He's won everything at yeah. this point. I mean, he's the he's the undisputed king of the no-gi jiu-jitsu scene. You can make your arguments about Hajer. You can make your arguments about Marcelo. But when it comes down to who is the no-gi king, there's no question about it. It's right. Gordon Ryan. And Gordon, not only does he push the sport to a new place with his technical excellence— but he knows how to get on the microphone. Yeah. He, he understands the way the game works. Yep. You don't get on the mic without saying somebody's name. You don't get on the mic without telling us what's coming next. Gordon Ryan understands those things. He understands how to bring eyeballs onto the sport. And the eyeballs ultimately are what that combined with the athletes all being in a brand new place athletically. We're just in a new spot in jiu-jitsu. It's the beginning of a new era. And you're giving me a perfect segue because it was just announced that Gordon Ryan is returning to UFC Fight Pass for the Fight Pass Invitational coming up in December. Uh, no news yet on who he's going to be competing against. But th- this guy is a superstar, and he's one that the, the next generation is looking up to. And why would you not want to try to pursue you know, the, the opportunity to become a Gordon Ryan? You don't have to just be a typical UFC champion or a boxing champion. You can be a jiu-jitsu champion and be one of the biggest stars in combat sports, and that is very new. I love that so much. <laughs> She's going to cry, <laughs> dog. I love that so much. Like, you can be a bigger champion in the jiu-jitsu community than a lot of these UFC athletes are right now. Like, that's crazy. Absolutely. And we are, as a UFC athlete, to be a UFC athlete, I don't care what your social media following is, you are one of the most amazing athletes in the entire world. You have to be an expert in five different sports. But if you just focus your brain towards one, like jujitsu, and really drive forward in that, you could you could be just as amazing and more epic than we are as UFC athletes. And now I have the opportunity to make just as much, if not more, money. 
One hundred percent. You know, we're 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 talking a lot about the next generation, and I do want to hit one more storyline before we get out of here regarding EBI. Um, Pat Chigoli. <laughs> he's sixteen years old. He's earned his way into EBI by winning uh, the EBI qualifier, which normally is uh, uh, four matches you have to win. Uh, he won six. He had extra. He had a, he had a, a qualifier to get into the qualifier. Yeah, I think he had to win two matches to get into the qualifying bracket. Right, yeah. Then he wins all the matches in the qualifying right. bracket. And so now he's qualified so, for mean, the bracket. That's we're, awesome. We're, we're at the Speaking Rock Entertainment Center tomorrow, which is a 21-plus venue. Unless you're Patrick Goli and you get to come in because you're fighting and competing. Yeah, they're going to have to put a little wristband on right. my boy. Yeah. But I'll tell you what. They need to put a wristband on everybody else that says that they're legal to compete with this kid because his leg locks are going to break some people off. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, like when, when he was going through the – if you haven't seen the the 10th Planet EBI qualifier that just happened, I know it's free on YouTube. It is, yeah. And, uh, well, actually – no, they put it on Fight Pass now, though, right? They, they might have. It started on out free on YouTube. But yeah. anyway, whether you're from Fight Pass or they can find it free on YouTube, you have to see this 10th Planet qualifier that Pat Shigoli goes through and wins. And when he's grabbing these heel hooks, yeah. he's ripping them into oblivion. It's true. He took Derek Rayfield's leg, and I thought he pulled his leg all the way off his body. One of the most violent leg locks that I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm excited. It's horrifying. It's horrifying. He can't tomorrow. go to a rated R movie. <laughs> Bro, he, I just want to watch He the is a rated R movie, dude. He is. He is a He's rated the R adult movie. slayer. <laughs> See? Oh. That's what they that's what he calls himself, the yeah. adult slayer. So, it all that's unfolds uh, tomorrow, EBI 20 the absolutes potential $50,000 on the line. I will be there. B Mac will be there. Vanessa Demopoulos oh, I'm will be there. I'm not missing it. Yeah. I'm not missing it. You need it. to go to sleep though before it happens. Can you promise me you'll try to lie down <laughs> and go to sleep? I'm so excited. Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna feed her an energy drink don't, before we get out of here. Don't do it. Don't do it. All right. We will see you for EBI again. It is tomorrow. I guess today by the time everyone's watching this on yeah, Fight that's true. What yeah, time that's is it now? True. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's actually Sunday. technically tomorrow. Don't worry it's about it. Don't worry tomorrow. about it. Thanks for letting me join you guys. Yeah, it's our so pleasure. happy that I was got to be here. It's fun. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for being the buffer between me <laughs> yeah. and the energy. Keep y'all split up. <laughs> All right. For Vanessa and B Mac, I'm TJ DeSantis. We'll see you next time for more extra rounds right here on UFC Fight Pass. This concludes our live broadcast of Extra Rounds. Are we still on the air? Watch the archive anytime on UFC Fight Pass or Facebook.com slash UFC Fight Pass. You can also listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or anywhere you listen to podcasts.